Welcome to Conversations with Cox and Kielseth, and to be more specific, that is filmmaker Alex Cox and myself, film curator Pablo Kielseth. Alex will join us by phone from his home in Oregon while I sneak away from my office to call him from one of the projection booths used by the International Film Series, which has been screening foreign and independent movies at CU Boulder since 1941. We will keep our chats to about 20 minutes as we discuss whatever movie-related topics grab our fancy. Thanks for joining us. Okay, action. Alejandro, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. We, we had a smoky day today, but um, also I have to tell you something that's very eerie. Uh, I'm looking out my window. The sun... I mean, it's just there's the oddest light because the, the because of the smoke and and uh, you know it's the the sun is setting, but it's so red. It is it is a red orb in in the horizon, and it's giving off this um, rather strange supernatural light right now. Wow! But um, yeah, it's it's well, strange. Oregon, Oregon, it, light, it's weird. You know, it's I mean, it's not so bad at the moment, but we've had horrible air quality up here. But not at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's cleared up yeah. a bit. But well, anyway, I digress because we are here today to talk about a recently restored film noir that uh, listeners can watch by going to internationalfilmseries.com and streaming it for 10 bucks. So it's um, this is a super interesting title. The title is Native Son. Um, it was it, it had a truncated release back in 1951, and it's based on the novel of the same name by the author Richard Wright. Uh, the book was published a decade earlier than the film in 1940. It was a groundbreaking bestseller at the time and was referenced in essays by James Baldwin and Frantz Fanon. Um, and now going back to Richard Wright himself, he was, uh, he was born in Roxy, Mississippi in 1908 and was uh, considered one of the first American uh, African-American writers to protest the white American treatment of black Americans. He later became a French citizen in 1947. What's interesting is that even though he was 42 at the time, he actually stars as the uh, teenage protagonist in this film version that was directed by Pierre Chanel, who is a, a, a Parisian who started off as a journalist before he embarked on feature films in the 1930s. Um, then during the German occupation of World War II, he escaped to South America, where he made a number of films, and Native Son is one of them. The story for Native Son takes place in Chicago. Uh, it has authentic bits of Chicago that get screened um, as background shots uh, here and there, but it was shot in uh, Argentina. You know, the other thing that I just, that to me, it's fascinating because I didn't, uh, I actually read Native Son when I was in college, but I don't remember the fact that Richard Wright, Richard Wright, you know, the author was, um, he'd been blacklisted, uh, and also that he died 10 years after the release of the movie of a heart attack at the age of 52. And his daughter, according to Wikipedia, thinks it was, you know, he was murdered. So a lot of interesting background to wow. this, um, interesting, uh, film noir and, you know, the, the, the landscape of film noir, film noirs are great. We all love film noirs. But one of the things about film noirs is that you will be hard pressed to find a film noir with a black protagonist. And this is this is it right here. Native That's Sun. right. Yeah. yeah. I can't so think of another think, one. So what do you think, Alex? I, I know you just saw it a couple of days ago. What was your take? I really liked it. I'm very glad that the IFS and Kino have teamed up to make it available, you know, because I actually think it's really worth watching for many reasons. I mean, it's an, it's an unseen noir that we never knew about um, that all yeah. of a sudden is available again. The whole construct of it, the idea of making a film set in Chicago in the studio in Buenos Aires is amazing. You know, it's like an Italian Western shooting a, a handful of scenes in Monument Valley and then going back to Spain and Rome to do the real movie. Um, right. So it, it and it really works thanks to like a very very good art department and very good cinematography. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's black and white cinematography, it's a film noir, and it's just smashing to look at, beautifully designed. 
and the confluence of the Chicago footage and the Argentinian footage is really good. They had the lead actor. So it's not just like background shots and plates. I mean, they had the, the principal actor in, you know, acting out part of the movie in these Chicago scenes. And the casting choice that this French director just insisted that the author of the book, Richard Wright, also play the, the hero of the film is a very probably ill-judged thing. Um, although although he does a good job, you know, for a non-professional actor who didn't want to be in the movie, you know, yeah. he does a good job. It's not like Mickey Spillane when he played Mike Hammer in The Girl Hunters. And that was quite terrible. Mickey Spillane was a dreadful actor. And huh, this guy no. isn't. But but then again, you think, what about if they really could have had a great, great American black actor to come down to Argentina, along with all the other cast members that came down from Los Angeles, you know, to right. be in the film. And and Paul Robeson springs to mind, but then Paul Robeson, of course, was blacklisted too and, and probably, and, and, and had his passport taken away. So he couldn't have right. come. But I mean, so it's got, you know, it's struggling with a kind of a weird directoral choice to insist that the author play the lead character and yet in spite of that the film works really well and the author does a does a i thought did a damn good job you know yeah i i, I don't know I, I think i might have read somewhere but i that uh the original uh person that they had in mind to play the protagonist was actually the uh, orson wells had actually put on a, a play of it and they originally tried to get the the person who was the lead in the play to also uh, do the the film, but there was something odd there that kept kept that from happening. Uh, I'm not remembering exactly right now. Yeah, I mean, I guess I was thinking as well about the about uh, Richard Wright, how he could like be so radical and and all this stuff and and not lose his passport. But it's interesting what you said that he'd actually got French citizenship in 1947 well i have to tell you something that i find fascinating which is that i got on imdb just minutes before calling you and you know i was just uh making sure that i, I had my dates and names correct and i uh clicked on richard wright uh as you know as the actor for native son on the imdb page and <laughs> The first that he's, he's, you know, I clicked on the link that shows that there were like five website links uh, on IMDb that were linked there. So I was like, okay, so I click on that. The very first link for Richard Wright is an FBI file that is 169 pages long. And if you click on that, it basically says it, it takes you to a Freedom of Information Privacy Act uh, page. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's just bizarre it's interesting i haven't again i mean i i just was doing a little preliminary wow. clicking can you so before. can you download his fbi file well uh again this is you know it's 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 the actual it, it lands you on the government page for uh freedom of information um records <sighs> and so i i think you then have to uh you would have to dig in there uh interesting for for how to get more information, uh, which I have not done. How fascinating! But, uh, so yeah, so there, there's a uh, there, there's quite a there's 169 pages on Richard Wright, thanks to the FBI. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, but I I, I want to also get just to get back to the movie, uh, say how impressed I was with the the sets for the Black Belt in Chicago. Um, I, I I think if if I if I'm not uh, remembering incorrectly here that one of the criticisms that was leveled against the film when it came out was that they actually recreated some of the slums in um, uh, Buenos Aires and uh, and and they got a little they got some flack because they re they were recreating slums uh, at a at a at a pretty high price when there were some very real slums. Some really good slums um, they could have used. <laughs> nearby. But at the same time, I want to I wanna back up the filmmakers here because uh, a slum in Argentina is going to be very different than a slum in Chicago. So I think that, you know, and the, the tenements that they do end up creating 
really were very um, uh, evocative of a space and a time. And, uh, and, they, and for me, they definitely gave this uh, sense of um, a, a, a noirish and pessimistic and uh, really run down vibe that was very cinematic. Certainly. Yeah, no, um, it's really well done. It's the, the whole construction of where they, they hide out and the different yeah. floors and the, the stack, you know, the, the staircases on the sides of the building, the liquor, liquor store across the street, the, um, the, you know, the neon or the advertising signs on the roofs of the building, the irony, oh, the sun kissed. I, I, I have to tell you, I absolutely loved that neon sign that was in the third act with the, because uh, it, it also kind of related to the dialogue too, that looked like a, you know, like a sun. And then yeah, the exactly. Like, I mean, we'll it's never, the author, we'll the author, the, the, author <laughs> the author speaks, you know? Yeah. Um, no, it, it, it was, it was a really, uh, worthwhile watch and, um, uh, a very, one of the more interesting film noirs that I've seen in quite a while. It's uh, really, and, it's really interesting to know, it's, it's an undiscovered film noir that probably the, the viewer hasn't seen before, you know, and, and there's some great characters and some great acting and it looks fantastic. Yeah, and it, it, uh, we should uh, uh, quickly make sure that people know that this was a film that, when it was released, um, because it was released in a truncated version, it was it didn't really hold up and it didn't do well, and and uh, the filmmakers were kind of depressed when that truncated version, the the truncated American version, is what then was released in Europe for a variety of. Oh uh, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, that they showed the yeah the messed up version. Um, but so 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 here's a chance to see a restoration of a very interesting film with the 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 part. Oh, and I want to give a shout out to uh, another unsung hero who was pivotal in bringing this full version to our attention. And I, I didn't write his name down, but it was a a 16 millimeter collector who basically he had a very nice collection. You could see from the intro to to the movie. Yeah. But but it's because of this random film collector. Who managed? Who who kind of knew what he was, you know, what he might be getting, and he, uh, because of him and his preservation of this sixteen millimeter film, he played a key part in bringing the, you know, this, you know, larger, the complete uh, version complete back version. to the screen because that's right, because they're awesome. Though most of the transfer is done from thirty five millimeter and looks really, really crisp. But you're right, there's yeah. a moment when they go to his sixteen millimeter print, which is lower quality really scratched and stuff but it's the it's the only record of the original film that there is and i think that's very cool too it's very, very enjoyable yeah. we're get, we're talking about native sun and uh, if you're listening uh, you can go to internationalfilmseries.com for 10 bucks you can uh, screen the this this film uh, and you'll be supporting the international film series as well as the independent distributors who are making the titles available uh, we thank you for doing that. If you are, yeah, uh, e yeah. <laughs> so it it really makes a difference, especially because right now we're in this weird twilight where we can't exhibit films in our normal location, and that's always been our draw. And so this is this is something that's just sort of a, a placeholder until hopefully, you know, we can get back to business whenever that is. Um, but it really but it helps is us great. Out, so. It's great also that these independent distributors, particularly Kino Lorber, I mean, they're being very good yeah. about splitting the gate with the exhibitor and trying to keep independent theaters alive. You know, yeah, it's fantastic that they're doing this. And uh, you listening, when you do this, uh, when you click on a title and you uh, you know plop down your credit card for the twelve bucks, ten bucks, four dollars, whatever it might be. You are really doing the both the us, the exhibitors, and the distributors um, a, a, a huge solid on it to do this. So, oh, yes. but, uh, before I forget, um, for anyone who is listening who is strapped for cash, I want to say that I do have about you know uh, three four freebie bonus codes, which I will gladly give away to the you know first come first serve. If you just drop us an email, I will give you the code. And if you've been listening and if you're strapped for cash, I want to make sure you see this for free. So just drop us a line. I'll give you a code. So, and it's worth it. It's worth it. Wait, wait, wait. One last thing. 
One yeah. last thing. You had me watch, speaking of uh, free movies that All you can right. just watch anywhere. You had me watch Idaho Transfer, which I hadn't, I didn't even, it wasn't even on my radar. I didn't even know about this uh, movie Nor that was I. directed by. Yeah, well, I knew go, nothing you, about it. <laughs> you tell me what, what put that on you? What put that on your horizon and tell people about it? Go ahead. It's a, it's a film that, that I've never heard of and never knew anything about, probably with good reason, um, directed by Peter Fonda. You know, Peter Fonda, he's generally thought of as being this kind of, oh, well, he could have been a great director, you know, because he did this movie called The Hired Hand as part of the same package of films as Dennis Hopper's The Last Movie. So he and he directed a couple more films. And the second movie that he directed after The Hired Hand was this movie, Idaho Transfer, which is just like an excuse to have all these shots of these girls taking off their 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 hiking boots, their socks and their and their pants so they can get in a time machine. <laughs> because they can't have they can't wear trousers in the time machine. And it's like it's like so well you can guess the rest but but except you can't guess the rest because the last half hour turns into what a sort of peter fonda's homage to the last movie or something about nuclear war and time travel and what's it about cuz i think what uh, idaho transfer came out in 1974 73 Oh, 73? Okay. 73, because um, Den Dennis and Peter did um, The Hired Hand and The Last Movie as kind of part of a package of films, so presumably all around about 1971. Yeah. And this was two um, years Well, later. I was just, I, I was, you know, because I, I think of um, the, the mid-70s range is when there were quite a few ecological-minded movies that were like, you know, Silent, um, was it Silent Running? Um, yeah. And uh, and so I I feel like this kind of goes into that mold. Yes, um, yes, yeah, a very low budget, but in the same genre as Silent Running. Yeah, yeah. What I thought was interesting is that one of the reasons probably no one knows about the movie is that the studio that made it, Cinemation, went bankrupt um, soon after making it. Oh, but and they made some been, other. They'd made some good films. You said. Yeah, well, they've been around since like I think. Uh, their, the very first film that they released was Baby Doll in 1956. And then they went on all the way through 75, mostly making kind of exploitation type stuff. But they also made Johnny Got His Gun and Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. Right. Which, you know, so, yeah. And so that that to me was sort of interesting. So these were people yes. who took chances. Yes. Um, they, they, they made very funky movies, um, but they took chances. But they went under uh, pretty much as soon as they made um, the Idaho transfer. And so there was just no, no marketing went behind it and nothing ever happened to the movie. And, and frankly, yeah, the first hour, uh, it, it just seems like it was just an excuse to get women to take off their pants um, for this to get on a time machine, which is, you know, very uh, it was anyway, the first hour is just not good. But the last the last, well, you say the last half hour, I, I might say the last 20 minutes. The, okay, the it, last 20 it actually, minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes was, I I really especially, especially appreciated the very, 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 very last four minutes. I thought that was when things kind of came together in a, in a way that I was like, you know what? I'm actually glad to have seen this just because <laughs> of, you know. And, of and this you can see for nothing. This is a movie that you can find on the, oh, yeah. on the internet on and YouTube. watch for free. So just yeah, you, you can fast forward to the last 20 minutes and, and yeah. see it's, what Pablo's It's the Idaho to. transfer and it's on YouTube and it's free. It's a very strange movie from 1973 from directed by uh, Fonda. So yeah, check it out. All right. Well, uh, yeah. cool. Let's. let's so there's two movie recommendations, some... but the, but it's more important, I think, to see the film noir. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you had to choose between Idaho Transfer and Native Son, make no mistake. Do the right thing. Go to Native Son. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they're both. If you can see them both, watch them both. Yeah. Why not? Cool, All man. Right. Well, I'll give you a buzz next week. And uh, to those listening, thanks for thanks for being part of the crew. And uh, thanks as always to Jason for putting these things together. Thank you, Jason. Yep. And more next week. All right. All right. Ciao. Ciao. And cut. Okay, that's a wrap.
Thanks again for joining Alex Cox and myself today. I'd like to thank Jason Phelps for handling the audio and Ted Thacker for letting us use the intro to his song, The Ballad of Slim Cessna, for the musical cues that bookend these conversations.